Most Americans are still going about life, investing, and retirement planning as if nothing unusual has happened to our financial system. And few seem to realize the repercussions of the $11 trillion that's been pumped into the U.S. financial system over the past 18 months. At least four billionaires have stated publicly that Americans aren't paying enough attention to this development. And now, a former Goldman Sachs banker says sooner than most people think, millions of Americans will potentially be pushed out of the middle class, out of private retirement, and out of a decent life and into a collectivist nightmare he calls financial lockdown. Find out how to protect yourself, your money, and your family with a free copy of this new report. In it, he'll show you the four steps he recommends you take immediately. Simply go to 2022wakeup.com to get your free copy. Again, that's 2022wakeup.com for a free copy of this new report. Welcome to Making Money. This is Matt McCall. Thanks for joining me. It is May 3rd, 2022. Time is flying. And we got a big show for you here today. We're going to talk about the up and coming FOMC meeting. 50 basis points, 75 basis points. We'll talk about that, what the odds are. We're going to talk about this market pullback. We had a big sell off last week, a heck of a turnaround on Monday. We're going to see what Tuesday can follow through. And I'm going to name some names. We're going to talk about some stocks. All that more coming up right now on Making Money. Again, I'm Matt McCall. Thanks for joining me. It is May 3rd, 2022. Here at Making Money with the aforementioned name, myself, Matt McCall. And uh, a bit of a wild <laughs> ride in, in the market the last few days. Um, especially last week, we had what, quite the sell-off. Dow was down almost 1,000 points on Friday. Uh, sold off into the close. Uh, we opened Monday. Uh, then we sold off uh, in, in the first few hours. Dow was down over 400 points. Uh, NASDAQ was down over 1%. And then, strangely enough, we rallied right back to actually close positive uh, for the day. And uh, it's now about a little after 10 o'clock here, uh, Tuesday morning, where we taped the show. And I'll, I'll show you a chart here, the S&P 500. It was uh, down a little bit to start it. Now, now we're about, up about four tenths of percent. And uh, a few things here in the charts, and, and many of you don't know, but I really, I started my career back at Charles Schwab in 2000, right out of, out of college uh, in Denver, Colorado as a stockbroker. But I always had a passion for charting and technical analysis. Uh, one of my colleagues, uh, my team lead at the time, who now uh, is a great friend of mine 20 some years later, uh, taught me technical analysis, how to do it. I actually wrote a book back in 08 called The Swing Trader's Bible, how to use swing trading for technical analysis. So when I look at the chart here of the S&P 500, uh, a few things that stand out. One, you can see the pullback here in February came down about 410 on, on the spies, rallied up to 460, a new multi-month high came back down on Friday, closed right above that 410 level. We broke it on Monday and then rallied back to close up for the day. And then a bit of a follow through today, that tail, that Japanese uh, candlestick chart, that tail you see, they call that a wick. And when you see that, it means that we sold off, but the buyers came back in and held support on a closing basis. Again, not to get too technical, but this is technical analysis. If you have follow through for a day or two on the upside, that is extremely bullish at a double bottom pattern. And if we go all the way back here to last May and April, a lot of consolidation at the 410 level. So we're at very important support, in my opinion, uh, when it comes to the market in the near term. If we break this, we could probably see another 5 to 10% in the downside in the overall market, in my opinion. Uh, so I think it's a level you know watch. Again, I'm a long-term investor, but I want to share my knowledge I have here of the charts. And that's what the charts are telling me in the near term uh, is what we're seeing here. So, you know, another thing I want to talk about before we get into the markets, I'm going to talk more about the market pullback and, and some history in the market. But, um, you know, Twitter, uh, Elon Musk made the you know, $54.20 per share uh, offer for Twitter. Twitter here right now, it's up a few pennies today, up 20 cents at 49.36. So it's trading at about a 10% discount because there are fears that uh, maybe he doesn't get the funding, something happens, it falls through, uh, the government steps in and doesn't let it go through, which if that happens, they should just we should all denounce our government because this is free speech. So about Twitter, I, I just did a, I was just a guest on, on somebody else's podcast uh, before I did this. Uh, Catherine Murray, she is a uh, she used to be an anchor up at BNN uh, in Canada, uh, Bloomberg up there. Uh, I used to go on the show back in the day. And uh, so she's on a new podcast. I jumped on it today and uh, she brought up Twitter. And, you know, my, my view on what's going on with Twitter and Elon Musk is the fact that 
we, we shouldn't be censored at all. Um, we, we live in America. It's the First Amendment. And it really shouldn't be censored if I, my view on something is different than yours. If I'm spewing flat out lies, you know, there's a tough line there because what, what is truth, what is not? I think if you start uh, disparaging people, putting people down in a way that's going to hurt them, cause mental illness uh, or, or pile, pile on mental illness, uh, bullying, stuff like that, th there's no place for that, in my opinion. Uh, can I go on Twitter and say, boy, that guy's a dummy and I don't agree with it and here's why? Sure, that's that's part of, you know, kind of having your voice. So I'm, I'm hoping Elon Musk brings that back, which I feel like he is. He's allowing us to, to, to share both sides of the story. Because if we only share one side of the story, we turn into Russia. We turn into China. We turn into many other countries that are authoritarian, uh, that, that have dictators, that you're not allowed to share the other side, the anti-government side. And again, this isn't a party line thing. This has nothing to do with being a Republican or being a Democrat or being in the middle or a libertarian. This has to do with the fact that we are smart enough to be able to make our own decisions. Let us read through things and make our decisions. Um, and, and again, it's I, I'm hoping this is great for Twitter. I'm hoping this is great for the country and for the world that we can once again be ourselves. But again, let's be kind to people. We don't have to bash people. And I, I'm guilty of it sometimes of saying, boy, that guy's an idiot, especially Jim Cramer, because I think he's an idiot. Uh, and I think what he does is a disservice to investors. So I have the right to call him out. But I'm not going to say anything about his family or anything else that he's doing. I don't like the fact that he's hawking his tequila now. You know, when he should be talking about stocks and the market, which I don't think he even cares about anymore. Uh, so, yeah, I can say that. That's what's great about being in America. Um, so I, I hope that that helps with Twitter. But as far as Twitter stocks concerned, I will say this. If you think this deal is going to get done, which I think it does at 5420, there's news out today that Elon might get some more backing, some more financing. That's about $5.20 to the upside from where it is right now. So that's a little over 10% upside if it goes through. So it may take nine to 12 months. To, who knows? The government drags their feet. But say it takes say it takes 12 months. I don't think it takes that long for it to go through. That's 10% in 12 months. That's just below the market average with not that much risk because I, I think there's a very, very high likelihood it happens. So if you're looking to park money somewhere, but you don't want to be in the market, you're too nervous, this could be what they call an arbitrage play. You're going into this uh, in anticipation of this deal getting done. And I didn't plan on talking about this, but while we're on the topic, uh, what about ATVI, which is Activision, which is the large uh, video game company, one of the largest out there? Well, they have a deal to be bought as well. And uh, their deal is to be bought, I'm going to pull up the notes here, I think at $94 a share, if I'm not mistaken, $95 a share. It's trading right now, as you can see in the chart, at $78.69. So they're saying right now that they don't think the deal is going to happen. Because between here and, and ninety-five dollars, you know, you're looking at about sixteen and a half dollars to the upside. That's about twenty percent, a little over twenty percent upside. So, you're, people are saying they don't think the deal gets done. Uh, antitrust laws, whatever it might be. So that's something again. But that's an arbitrage. If you want to take that risk, that you think that deal gets done at some point next year, again, you're making over twenty percent, much more than the market average. If the deal doesn't get done, the stock could easily fall 20%. So just know that. But there are some arbitrage deals out here right now uh, that are that, that, that are potential buys, uh, in my opinion. Um, before we talk about the pullback in the markets, I, I want to talk a little bit more about uh, the trip I took over to uh, to UK and the EVTOLs uh, that are out there. You know, I, I got to tell you, folks, the, the, the more and more that I uh, think about the air taxi situation and where we're going to be in the future... It just becomes more and more realistic to me. I, I have a funny story. When I flew in from London, um, I'm losing track of days. I think it was Saturday. Let's say it was Saturday. When I flew in Saturday night, and I got in from London, left Saturday morning. Uh, it was pretty interesting because I got in a car. A 75-year-old man from Virginia picked me up. Uh, great gentleman. We had a great talk, hour and a half here to Baltimore. He, when the first thing he says, we're not even out of the airport yet. He goes, I can't wait till those flying cars are out because I'm going to get one. And I looked, I, I shook my head. I said, is this a joke? I said, you know, I just came from the first Verda port in the world uh, where the flying cars. And I explained it to him. He was so happy. But we got there and he's like, you know, I want to I get your information. You know, send me what you have. He couldn't find his car. He just cleaned out his car, his, his business car. He was so upset. He wrote his dad's number. 
I didn't get back to him right away. So I came in the office Monday. Mind you, this guy lives in Virginia, never comes to Baltimore. I leave the office around two o'clock to go to an appointment. Who picks me up but Samuel, the same exact gentleman. Happened to get a call from somebody who wanted to go to D.C. to Baltimore. He was going to head right back. He's like, I'll take one ride. And he picks me up. I mean, what is the odds of that in the world that Sam picks me up on there? So I don't know if that's the world telling me that flying cars and air taxis and EVTOLs are the future or not. Uh, but boy, it means something. So I, I, I think I'm on to something here when it comes to flying cars, whether that be um, you know the, the, the universe telling me that or, or something from above telling me that. Uh, but boy, that, that to me was, was just a fascinating story. And the odds of that happening are so low. Uh, and it's so neat because we both had such a good time in the car chatting. Uh, that, was, that was great, really great uh, to reconnect with him for the short ride back home. So what I want to talk about today, I'm going to talk about a couple stocks, uh, but what I want to talk about is the market. And I got some great statistics uh, when it comes to this. And, you know, you, you take a look and, and I'm just throwing these numbers out and we'll talk about them as we go along. But uh, on average, if we go into a bear market and mind you, uh, right now, the S&P is down about 13 and a half percent, 13 and a half to 13 uh, percent from its high. The average pullback, average annual drawdown in the S&P 500, some years down 5%, some down, down 50, whatever. The, an, the annual pullback, the average pullback, going back to 1950, so we're 70 years, the average is 13.5%, and that's where we are right now. So people are freaking out that we're down 13.5% in the S&P 500, but that is the average pullback over the last seven decades. Again, let's put these things in perspective. It, it's it, and, and a typical correction, which happens about once per year, almost on the button, is 13 to 14% as well, right where we are this week. So please keep that in mind. Bear markets are normal, folks. Uh, there have been 26 bear markets in the S&P 500 going back to 1928. Uh, there's also been 27 bull markets uh, at that time. So you say to me, well, Matt, there's only been one more bull market than a bear market. The big difference is the bull markets on average last about three years, where uh, the, the bear markets last on average about nine and a half months. So that's a big difference. Um, also, stocks tend to gain during a bull market on average 114%. Bear market average, when you actually go into a bear market, which is down over 20% or more, 36% on downside. So that's where you get the huge gains throughout the years uh, when it comes to the S&P 500. Um, you know, every three and a half, three point six years, that's the long term average frequency between bear markets. Um, you know, it's, you look at this and, and it's it tells me that, yes, bear markets, they've been less frequent since World War Two. I'm looking at charts and notes down. So I'm looking at, uh, you know, between 28 and 1945, before World War Two, uh, there are 12 bear, bear markets, about one every one point four years. Now it's about one every five point four years since the World War Two. So they don't happen as often. This is what this is the reason right now I'm about to tell you why you don't panic sell when the market pulls back, why you don't try to time a bear market and to get back in. Because half of the S&P 500's best days in the last 20 years, best days, half of them came during a bear market. So you're missing out on those. That another third of them, 34 percent, happened in those first two months into a new bull market which nobody picks the bottom, so you're probably missing that. So you're missing 84% of the best days, most likely, if you're trying to time the market, unless you actually truly do it perfectly, which you probably don't, honestly. That's going to hurt the portfolio, and you're chasing your tail. So for me, this is a situation where you want to continue to invest in stocks over time, especially in your 401k or in your retirement accounts. Dollar cost average, folks. Keep putting money in every two weeks of your paycheck. Because you're buying at lower prices and your dollar costs averaging down. You don't want to try and pick. Just continue to do it. I do it myself. I max out my 401k of a year and I, and I just spread it out. Spread it out. Uh, let's, what else we got here? Uh, assuming you have a 50-year investment horizon, which you know a lot of you are probably into that 50-year investment horizon, you're going to live through 14 or so bear markets. So you're going to live through a lot of your time frame. It's okay. Bear markets happen. Recessions happen. I want to live through a lot of bear markets. That means I lived a long damn time. I'm going to live through a lot of recessions. That means I have to enjoy my life a very long time. It's okay. You know, of the last 92 years of market history, bear markets have only comprised 20.6 of those years. Another way to put that, folks, stocks were up nearly 80% of the time. 80% of the time. So you tell me 
over a very space like a century, last century, where else in the world can you do something that you're guaranteed about 80% chance in your favor? Four out of five. That's why the stock market is the single greatest wealth creation engine out there for the average American ever. Sure, you can start your own company. Sure, you can get a good job, become a doctor, a lawyer, or, or IT specialist and make a ton of money and become very wealthy. Absolutely, you can inherit money, you can hit the lottery. There's a lot of ways you can make money and become wealthy. But for the average American, which is majority of people out there, which was me growing up, I couldn't have been more average. The single greatest way to create wealth for yourself is through the stock market, investing in solid companies over the long term. There's nobody in the world that can argue with me. That is a pure fact, folks. But the other fact is you're going to have times where the market goes up. You have times where the market goes down. And those times where it goes down or it goes sideways are very difficult to hold on. But again, over time, it goes up. Any 10-year rolling time frame over the last 50 years in the S&P 500, 10 years isn't that long a time you have a 93% chance of making money. You know, uh, actually, it's longer than 50 years. It's going back to 1930. You know, the only times when it was down were the years right after the Great Depression in the early 30s and uh, 2009, 10-ish, because it dealt with the tech bubble and it dealt with the great financial collapse. And both of those years where it was down, those 10-year rolling years, it was down, one was down less than 1%, one was down about 1.5%. So it wasn't as if you were getting crushed. Uh, and, you know, the average uh, over that time frame is about 13.2%, that annual gain. When you break above that average on, on a chart, it typically runs for 18 years where the returns, those rolling returns are over 13.2%. We're in a fourth year of that. So I really believe we are in a rolling, rolling 2020s. I believe we have great upside. Will we have a recession be before the end of the rolling 2020s? Probably a couple. Are we going to have a bear market? Probably a couple. We have corrections. Absolutely. Several. All that stuff's going to happen. But I truly believe that the market, especially our trends, will be so much higher in the future from here that you just have to buy and hold. Buy in weakness. Find good companies. Continue to add to your portfolio. Continue to diversify your portfolio into the new trends. And speaking of that, I was just going to share a couple stocks. I was just, as I mentioned, I just did a podcast with uh, Catherine Murray and uh, I shared a couple stocks with her. I'm just going to share a couple with you that I shared with her, but I want you to go check out her show though too. What I shared was DraftKings, DKNG. And DraftKings is a $6 billion uh, sports gambling, um, betting, iGaming as they call it, uh, company. You know, Morgan Stanley and, uh, you know, I don't follow the investment makes that much, but the research is good. And uh, they came out and they, they said that the U.S. Uh, sports betting and iGaming industry uh, in 2019 uh, was valued at less than $1.5 billion. And they predict by 2025, just three years from now, it will be at $21 billion as more states legalize uh, sports gambling, as more ways to bet interactively come out, as there's more, um, they call prop bets, you know, betting on... How many points is Joel Embiid going to score on game four? You know, that kind of stuff. How many rebounds will he have? Will he have more rebounds than uh, Jimmy Butler or whatever it might be? Those are called prop bets. And they continue to grow. And I, I know a lot of people are in sports. I, I'm a sports fanatic that bet on sports. And not for a living. And not that they're going to, it's going to change their life that they win or lose. Just to add a little action to the game. And it's going to take off. It's going to continue to go. So I think DraftKings is very, very well positioned for that. Uh, along with a couple others, but you know, at a six billion dollar company, last year uh, in twenty or sorry in twenty twenty, they did six hundred fourteen million in sales, so about ten times sales of two years ago. By twenty twenty four, just two years from now, they're expected to do three point three four billion. So a matter of four years, uh, they're seeing that go up about five and a half x. That's big growth, folks. You know, you're trading at less than two times sales based on 2024. For a company that's growing like this and a trend that's growing like this, that's insane. Stock's at 15 bucks. I think it's a $60 stock in the next three or four years. That's a four bagger. So that's that's one to keep an eye on. Again, a trend that's not going anywhere. I don't care about, you know, inflation. I don't care about high interest rates. 
I care about the war in Ukraine, but I, I don't, it doesn't come into my decision making when I'm looking at a trend like this over the long term. It just doesn't. It doesn't affect it. In the short term, sure, it can hurt stocks, but it's not going to affect the long term. It's not going to stop people from, from betting on, on sports. It's just not. So that's one I wanted to share with you. Uh, and another uh, in a completely different realm is uh, MP materials. I've talked about this one in the past, symbol MP. And uh, they are the largest um, rare earth minerals uh, company in the Western Hemisphere. Really the only viable one going on right now here uh, in, uh, in uh, North America. And uh, again, stock hit an all-time high in uh, early April, end, end of March, early April, and pulled back with everything else. Pulled back from 60 bucks down to 38. It's at 39 and changed today, up about 2.5% today. But man, oh man, you look at a company like this, folks, and uh, you know, as I mentioned, largest producer of rare earth minerals in Western Hemisphere. Uh, it's really the only one in North America doing anything. Uh, this is about the supply chain. Uh, the supply chain, you think about the, the trade war we have with China a couple of years ago, obviously what happened with COVID. Uh, now what's going on with the war in uh, 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 Ukraine. And you have some bad actors that we get rare earth minerals from. Rare earth minerals are critical to the future of the roaring 2020s, whether through, through batteries, through technology, through defense, through electronics, you name it. And who controls a lot of this? Who controls the refining of a lot of this? China. And yeah, China needs us. We need them. It, it goes both ways. However, if something were to happen, God forbid, and China's like, no more, you're cut off. We're screwed when it comes to rare earth minerals. So that's why you're seeing MP here in the United States really doing well. And when you think about a, a miner like this, I think right away, oh man, they must be hemorrhaging money. They must be losing money. They're profitable. This is a profitable company. And the top and bottom line, revenue and earnings are expected to grow annually the next three years, annually over 25%. And I think that's really low. I think it's gonna be much higher. I think this is a great way to play the future of anything in the roaring 2020s, whether it be electric vehicles, uh, whether it be drones, uh, whether it be uh, electronics, whether it be storage, cloud, phones, you name it, devices. All this stuff needs batteries and, and, and uh, uses metals that are, that are rare earth minerals. And the refining aspect of it, we don't refine any here in the United States. But MP is trying to. Uh, another company from uh, out of Australia, Linus, potentially getting uh, some backing from, from the U.S. government to start doing it here as well. So there are companies out there that, that are starting to make a move here in the States. And we realize that we can't rely on some of the bad actors that are really our adversaries. And when it comes to rare earth minerals, we need to be self-sufficient. And I think we're going to see a ton of money come in. I think MP could be a big winner there. So I'm going to end it there because it is Tuesday. And I feel like every Tuesday I do the show or every other Tuesday, I'm rushing to the airport to get somewhere else. Um, my promise is to get rid of these bags under my eyes because I've been literally living on planes and hotels and couches for the last, I feel like, two weeks. But I'm getting on a plane again in about two hours. So I want to thank everybody for watching. Thank you for the support. Uh, we will be back Thursday. But Wednesday, don't forget, the FOMC is making their decision. Will the Fed raise interest rates 50 basis points or 75? My bet is for 50. But I'm going to have a video, a little quick five-minute video live as soon as they come out from my new studio, giving you my view of what happened, uh, what Chairman Powell said, and most importantly, how the markets reacted. So all that coming up on Wednesday and Thursday, back to the regular scheduled show. So again, thank you so much for supporting us. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to like, spread the word, subscribe, all that kind of fun stuff. And uh, we'll be back Thursday. I'm Matt McCall, and that was Making Money. Opinions expressed on this program are solely those of the contributor and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Stansbury Research, its parent company, or affiliates.